Okay, welcome to another episode of Crime Pace with Botany Dozen. Good morning from uh, central Tasmania. We're uh, near Lake St. Clair National Park. We're in an understory of Eucalyptus delicatensis. It's chilly as hell. It's December, I don't know, 4th or 5th, which is the equivalent of June 4th or 5th in the Southern Hemisphere since you got that whole uh, axial tilt thing. And uh, it's chilly as hell, but there's still mosquitoes and tiger snakes, which are a member of the cobra family Elapidae. So we're going to see what's going on in the understory here and uh, go check it out. You know, barking at eucalyptus delegatensis. Barks are one of the most, uh, the bark is one of the most distinguishing factors when looking at uh, eucalypt species, trying to figure out what species you're looking at. That combined with uh, uh, a pre existing knowledge of what grows in that location, you know, unless you have flowers and fruits, but uh, you can see they're often very high up. You can sometimes look in the duff below. Eucalypts, of course, are uh, heavily mycorrhizal, ectomycorrhizal, so there's a diversity of fungal species that associate with them. You get this rich duff. You see, you got this lycophyte down here, too. Very moist forest down here. It's insane. I, the mosquitoes were just going to town. Too. I don't know how they, it's like 40 degrees right now. You know, I should be wearing gloves. I don't know how they're they're flying around. The mosquitoes have these little tufts of hair on their back too. Very bizarre. That little lycophyte must be moist enough down there. How many back? How many species of microbes, uh, as well as a fungi, are uh, you know being mycorrhizal and saprotrophic? So Proteaceae is a big family down here. This is Lomatia polymorpha. Okay, one of a uh, few species of Lomatia you get. You get divided leaves, kind of plastic feeling, uh, glabrous foliage. All right, Proteaceae is a relatively uh, ancient plant family. Also in Proteaceae is this guy right here, Banksia. <clears throat> Banksia marginata. You can see those comb-like uh, wooden fruits on there, which of course respond to fire. Genus Banksia is huge in Australia. I think you only get two or three species here. But uh, it's a giant infrutescence. So when it was blooming, there were dozens upon dozens of flowers there. And uh, now, if it was pollinated, there's uh, quite a few seeds. It's just waiting for a fire to come through, get those little mouths on that infrutescence to open. Once all uh, these old pollen presenters, that's, which is what those hairs are, old pollen presenters, uh, fall off. And here you go, Leptocophila, Leptocophila pagano calyx. You can see the uh, white flowers on there. Jesus Christ. One of many members of the family Ericaceae, subfamily Epacridoidae, uh, that grow down here uh, in Tasmania. Juniperina uh, used to be the, uh, used to be Scientodes, uh, Juniperina. You can see why they called it that. Juniper-like foliage with parallel venation on it. You know, bright white abaxial surface on the other side. Here's the fruit. I guess it's edible, but it, uh, it's probably a little uh, acrid, like many members of the Manzanita family. Look at it. I'm, I'm messing up the game. For the, what, what is it? There's, there's no flowers there, buddy. You're not going to get any insects. What's he doing? Look at the calyx on those fruits. This spider is waiting for something to come by so he can nab it. But, uh, you know, it's mostly going to be birds going for that uh, those berries, I imagine. Ooh, a meadow. A meadow dominated by uh, Gymnosheenus, which is in the Carex family, Cyperaceae, a.k.a. the button grass which was uh, used by Aboriginal people to uh, make baskets and what the shit. Very important plant, very dominant plant as well. And here we go, member of uh, the Myrtaceae family, the Eucalyptus family, the Guava family. Uh, this is Melaleuca squamia, swamp Melaleuca. You got dozens of stamens surrounding a central disc with the uh, ovary just beneath it. And uh, look at all the hairs and whatnot along the stem. Leaves less than a centimeter long, lanceolate, alternating. A kind of world, yeah, they're whirling, I would call it. All right, little, uh, little shrub, All right? Probably, uh, probably, you know, associated with a, quite a few different fungi in the soil as well. All right, this family is huge in all of Australia and as well as Tasmania. Well, Tasmania is Australia, but you know what I mean. I can't get over how chilly it is here. Oh, look at it! Look at this shit. Is that possum shit? Which marsupial? I can't get over how chilly it is here. It's unreal, and I can't get over the fact that there's mosquitoes. They can tolerate it, as well as members of the cobra family, the elapidae, the tiger snakes, that are out, you know, when it's 45 degrees. They're black, of course, so they can, you know, catch all that solar insulation, but Jesus Christ, it's, <laughs> it's fucking nuts here. What a bizarre, what a bizarre environment. Here we go, another member of the uh, Proteaceae, often confused with the genus Orites, which has follicles, whereas this genus Hakea has these little woody knobs. This is Hakea lysosperma. That thing will stay on the uh, plant for, uh, you know, until the fire comes through. Basically, I can still see the old style on there. Here's uh, a fruit maturing, 
after the uh, flower's been pollinated, you can see the old pollen presenter slash style. There's the fruit. Give another few months, it'll turn to one of those woody follicles. Look at it, needle-like leaves with an ab bright white abaxial surface to them. And a couple other hachia species here, but this one forms a cone-shaped tree up to about, I don't know, 30 feet tall. This one's uh, kind of short, but they get a little bit taller than that. Growing in the understory to Eucalyptus delicatensis. Ah, and another, another cool proteaceae. You got to take this eucalyptus bark, which is everywhere, of uh, Vitalopia truncata. I don't know how this thing's flowering now. It's so chilly, and it's supposed to get down to one degree centigrade tonight. So that's, you know, what is it, 30, 33.8 degrees Fahrenheit, just above freezing. It's fucking bizarre. Anyway, you could see those uh, pollen presenters. Emerging out of those recurved tepals, four recurved tepals. The tepals, of course, have the, the anthers on the distal end. You can see one right there. Looks like it shed its pollen already. It's not white. So those pollen presenters present pollen for a minute, and then, they, then uh, later on they become uh, pistillate and receptive to pollen. Look at the one. The one on the back is all juicy and whatnot. Very important plant. Looks like it's, uh, you, you would think it's pollinated by birds, seeing those red flowers, and that's, that is indeed the case. You're going for the nectar. They end up... Uh, coming into contact with that pollen and then spreading it to another plant uh, like the one over there. You can see it forms a small tree. Right here in the understory of the Eucalyptus delicatensis, look at how massive that tree is. It's got to be 120 feet tall, probably. You know, I come in here, come out anywhere in Australia will will change your mind about eucalypts. If you don't like them, look at that. Is that a hay? You know, that's an acacia. That's acacia dilbata. All right. It's so cold here. Eucalypts are, are such cool. It's such a cool fucking genus. And they're so important ecologically. And look at how different the juvenile leaves look from when they're older. Look how broad that is compared to uh, when they're much older and more narrow and lanceolate. Got a, like a little red stem. God, I've been I've been just lurking on this beautiful bastard inspecting. Look at look at all the nectar coming out of that. That's <laughs> definitely not insect pollinated. All right. Otherwise, it wouldn't be making that much juice. Look at that. That is that is a, trying to get those birds in there. Look at that little anther too. Add Nate to the people. How about that? Oh my god, that's delicious. I just tried some of the nectar on this. Look at that. Look at look at those nectar beads. Oh my god, it's so sweet. Oh yeah, I got the COVID right now. We were doing rails of uh, you know a billion viral particles at once in the van last night. Got the COVID from Woody. He picked it up on a plane or a bus in New Zealand or some shit. Anyway, standing on this large log of. Uh, Eucalyptus delicatensis, just to give you a nice money shot of that tilopia, that member of the proteaceae. Look at that thing. What a fucking banger. You know, I, this ought to be in every native garden down here. There's a nursery called Plants of Tasmania in Hobart. They, I hear they do good work. I haven't been there myself to see it yet. Look at it. And then, of course, you got the little poison peas down there. Pultinea. That's Pultinea juniperina. You also got Oxalobium uh, ellipticum, which has leaves in a whirl, but Pultinea... Uh, Pultinae, I believe, has alternate leaves. Heavily toxic foliage down there, but many marsupials uh, are resistant to it. They can, I think, they can gnaw on that without the. Well, maybe not this species, but a lot of them, a lot of this tribe, Morbellia, the marsupials can gnaw on without the, uh, without dying. Not so with uh, mammals that aren't from Australia, though. Beautiful forest. Look at these chilly, but beautiful. Pult Let's go check out that Pultinae. Oh, oh, oh. Keep in mind how cold it's going to get tonight, too, and this thing is just rife with flowers. God, the, the tribe Merbellia, the peas in Australia are so cool. Most, a lot of them are tribe Merbellia, the poison peas, all right? So these have free filaments, free, 10 free filaments instead of nine fused together and then a single one free. They, got, they lack the isoflavone chemistry. Uh, that uh, most Look at the point on those leaves, too, juniperina, because it looks like a juniper. That makes sense. They lack the isoflavone, you know, soil, uh, the isoflavone uh, secondary chemistry, like you'd get in like a soybean or something. And they have one seeded fruits. So a pea pod with only one seed in it. And they're immensely successful here. I wonder, they, they got to have rhizobial bacteria too, because everything's got a gimmick on these nutrient poor soils. God, I love this whole tribe though. There's, ah, fuck, you go to like Western Australia, you'll see some ones that'll blow your mind. And they make that uh, Poison 1080, which has been so useful in eradicating feral cats and foxes. It's sad, you know, but you can't let them hang out because they'll kill everything. They cause extinctions. So they've been dumping 1080 pellets, you know, which most marsupials don't die from. Uh, it's not preferred, but, you know, 
the cra those cats and foxes can be crazy little bastards. So they got to do something, you know. But they make that 1080 from another species in this. Uh, they synthesize it after a chemical found in uh, another species in this tribe, Merbellia. So there you go, Pultanea juniperina. Little ketchup and mustard flowers. Beautiful but deadly. There we go. There we go. There's a nice money shot. Nice money shot of those stamens. All right. Forgive, forgive my hands. You know, I haven't been using lotion. I forgot to go in for my weekly manicure at the spa. But uh, you can see those stamens. It doesn't quite look like there's 10. There are quite a few. But you can see they're they're free and they're not fused. Okay. Which, you know, keep in mind for the P subfamily, Faboidae, of the P family, Fabaceae, is, is somewhat, uh, somewhat rare. Especially in North America. Then you got this guy looking like a juniper, looking like one of the quote-unquote red cedars you'd see in North America with the shaggy bark, Leptospermum linigerum. See that? But it's Myrtaceae. It's a member of the guava family, the woody-fruited clade of the guava family, which is what most of the members of Myrtaceae are down here. I guess you get some Eugenia to it. It's, it's a soft fruit. Look at that. Lin linigerum because it's woolly on its stem and with the shit. Those are not the flowers coming out. Those are the bracts of... Uh, New foliage, new vegetative growth. Indicative of the genus Leptospermia, you got these uh, woody fruits. Little woody capsule donuts, star-shaped donuts. Another important member of uh, Ericaceae, the Apacrid subfamily, Cyathodes parvifolia. Looking like a juniper, a new veg growth uh, coming out in those uh, little green bursts. Brighter green than the rest. Look at the leaves on the underside. You got that parallel venation, that bright white abaxial surface. Pink berries. When the flowers are pollinated after the fruit matures, after that ovary matures, there's the old flowers on there. Juniper-like foliage. Everything is juniper-like foliage here. Probably an adaptation to herbivory. And the pink fruits are spread by birds. Edible to humans too, but they probably don't taste very good. Like, uh, you know, kind of like a manzanita berry. Oh, well, there's a uke delegate tensis with about an eight-foot spread. You can't really tell with the wine angle. There you go. We'll get a, put my hand in there for scale. Yeah, it's, it, that's it. It's an eight foot spread diameter breast height. Okay, this is a really cool tree right here. You can see that this one's only about 40 feet tall. I can get up to about, I don't know, I suppose I can get up to like 80 feet, maybe a little bit bigger. Phyllocladus esplenia folius. You can see that glabrous foliage. Relatively simple, quote unquote, primitive venation on that glabrous, uh, glabrous foliage. These are monoecious plants, so you also have the male cones right there. And uh, this is a member of the family Podocarpaceae, which uh, is uh, almost entirely southern hemisphere. You get a few in Mexico, you get a few in Asia, but it's uh, most of the bulk of the family is southern hemisphere. Evolved in the Jurassic, so somehow this this species has made it in uh, to the present day. Give it up for it for that, all right? And there's a few species in the genus Phyllocladus. It's in, like I said, it's in Podocarpaceae, but it's, it's so it's it's genetically somewhat distant, so it's kind of its own long lonely branch in a family they call this uh this is called the uh, celery pine because the way that foliage looks you know the the, the european uh, uh colonizers when they came here just uh just called everything a pine you know that i guess they didn't know any better any conifer was a pine all right you know they were calling them pines you know before they went about the whole genocide thing which is uh Really kind of atrocious, but you know, they did the same thing in North America. They did it, you know, Australia's actually pretty progressive on it. I will say that. They did a fucking land acknowledgement on the plane when we landed, you know. That, that kind of shit normally makes me want to puke because it seems so fraudulent in North America. Just kind of a performative and fake. It's just something for the, you know, guilty white liberals to do when they're not attacking each other on Twitter. But here it seemed pretty appropriate. I was impressed. And, uh, you know, like I said, they've come a long way uh, from uh, atrocities that were committed 100 years ago. Anyway, there you go. Celery pine. Phyllocladus esplenia foliage because it looks uh, kind of like a kind of fern like those leaves. I had no idea they can get uh, so big because I've only I'd seen them in San Francisco Botanic Garden before and uh, they were not large trees there. I think primarily because they're grown from cutting. But and I'm always amazed at how tiny many of the podocarps uh, in Tasmania their fruits are. We saw Ligerostrobus the other day that the, they're not fruits, sorry, cones. They're naked seeds. They were fucking tiny. How did these things get established? You know, they got so many angiosperms to compete with. Oh, never mind. I'm full of shit. Those were the microstroboli I was showing you. Here are the megastroboli. That makes sense. They're a little bit larger. They're immature. They're waiting to get some of that windborne pollen. And I got that uh, red protective pigment to, uh, you know, prevent them from, uh, from getting cooked in the sun. That, that fresh foliage. All right, wind dispersed pollen. Look at that one. That makes more sense. See, they're a lot. They're they're larger than those tiny shits. 
See that these are why do the micro strobe I have that bright red color to them though? I guess it's just protective, not attractant. Bizarre. Podocarps are still so elusive and mysterious. Alright, this is nice. Another tree of Gondwanan distribution, okay? Members of this family also occur in Chile, okay? So, you know, this whole lineage evolved back when Chile was connected to Antarctica on one side, and Antarctica was connected to uh, Australia on the other. So this is Eucryphia lucida, a.k.a. Leatherwood. All right, not flowering now. Got white uh, white petals when it does flower from the family Eucryphiaceae. I think they might have placed it in Cunoniaceae uh, right now. But anyway, with those two, those biparted opposite leaves, easy to tell apart, okay? Two at a time, then, you know, and then the axis... Uh, whirls 90 degrees uh, the other way and then puts out another two leaves, etc. So uh, I guess they use this for lumber. I don't know what they do with it. Uh, honey, too. The flowers are uh, important ecologically. Understory tree right here. They can get big, but they're generally an understory tree. Another family that not many people in the Northern Hemisphere are familiar with. And here we go. Yet another understory plant in a proteaceae. Okay, another one of those ancient goddamn angiosperms. Right, evolving in the Cretaceous. Sometime in the mid-Cretaceous, maybe earlier. Anyway, this is a Persunia mulleri, and there's the uh, follicle, or the fruit, the, the fruit of it, which is technically a follicle. You can see the pollen presenter is left over. The, the four tepals have fallen off, as one can see. So you got a, a superior ovary. See where they were attached down there? Uh, white tepals went out uh, they're going off, right? See Persunia in uh, Western Australia. And then there's those whorls of leaves, right? Scleropolis, kind of feeling like plastic. No hairs. Maybe there's hairs on the stem. Are there hairs on the stem? No, not that I see. Pretty glabrous. All right, got the flowering done already, which is bizarre to me because it must have been colder than it is now, uh, you know, when these were flowering a month or two ago. There we go. There's the other species of poison pea. You can tell this is oxalobium and not, and not pultinea because it's got whorls of leaves around the stem, not alternating leaves. So oxalobium ellipticum. But just as toxic with that secondary chemistry, as the Pultinea, look at how the leaves end in that little uh, accumulate point, too. See that kind of kind of fuzzy and whatnot. And then there's those uh, beautiful, fibaceous, papulinaceous flowers with uh, all the stamens in that red keel. Little ketchup and mustard flowers. You see a little stamen poking out. Again, free stamens not fused. Glaber's foliage, uh, adaxially, and then abaxially. Uh, you got the. Uh, you got some hairs on it? Oh, yeah, you got some hairs. How about it? Now, down by the river where the platypus hang out, uh, we got a species of acacia, one of many in Australia, because this is the epicenter of diversity for the genus. This is acacia mucronata. There's the flowers all done. Many, many stamens in each, in each uh, individual flower. And, of course, the leaves, like so many acacias here, uh, are, in fact, phyllodes. You have photosynthetic petioles instead of true leaves on mature plants. When they're young... They got, uh, you know, bipinnate leaves, looking like a typical uh, pea family, basically. But uh, as they mature, they just get these uh, photosynthetic petioles, these uh, phyllodes. And here's another species of acacia. This one doesn't get phyllodes. This one just maintains, maintains its juvenile leaves throughout its whole life. Acacia diobata, somewhat invasive in California. But look at that glaucous blue foliage. You can almost forgive it, okay? Nitrogen fixation going on in the roots with the rhizobium bacteria. They can form relatively large trees. They can go, get upwards of 60 to 80 feet tall. And then, of course, saving some of the best for last, the genus Nathophagus, another paleoendemic, another relic of Gondwana, okay? Occurring in both South America and Australia, and uh, the Australia region, you know, New Zealand included, New Caledonia, etc., up to New Guinea, uh, not because of dispersal, but because of paleoendemism, because of a, a, a lasting result of tectonic shifts, of Antarctica splitting away from Australia and Chile. So this is Nathophagus Cunninghamii. Look at those tiny leaves. It's an evergreen. You also have Nathophagus gunnii at higher elevations, which is deciduous. Look at the beautiful new growth on those leaves, all right? Ectomycorrhizal, a member of the oak order, Phagales. They sometimes call them the southern oaks, the southern beaches. They also associate with a, uh, a parasitic fungus, which is edible, that grows on the trees and it creates its own galls in the genus Cytaria. And each species of Nathophagus, well not each, but a lot of them have their own species of Cytaria they associate with. So it's likely a relationship that goes back, uh, I don't know, 80 million years or so with Cytaria and Nathophagus. Cytaria doesn't seem to take the trees down, it just kind of hangs out, you know? But these can get massive. You can, they can see them sometimes, they're four, four, four foot diameter breast height. 
and of course, you know, you see these guys just hanging out. You know, who doesn't love an echidna? Look at that, just like a, a furry little spine ball. What's he doing? He's digging for stuff? Look at it. That is so adorable. Adorable and uh, threatening. The way monotremes, they lay eggs related to platypuses, okay? They're the only extant members of the monotreme group uh, next to platypuses, platypi. But platypi have uh, venom glands on, uh, on their ankles, okay? On their, their hind legs, which will really mess you up. I'll put you in a hospital. These guys don't have the venom. But they do have a, a adorable little waddle, though, don't you? Huh? You like the bugs? What's she going for? See, they dig around, they're diurnal, they're hanging out. Okay, we lurked the platypus the other day too, but it was uh, they just hang out in the rivers. They're kind of uh, kind of easy to miss. We just seen it for a few seconds. Okay, later on, guy. Okay, there we go. Look at that. There's there's a nice specimen of that cytaria, that edible fungus uh, that forms its own galls on the southern beach on Nanatophagus. And it kind of tastes like peaches, like kind of bland peaches. These aren't ready yet. When they're when they're mature, it is an ascomycete fungus. Ooh, it's jelly-like inside. When they're mature, uh, you, it's basically a bunch of those, those little cupules you can see uh, once I split it open. See that? But right now they're just forming these little, these little berry-like fruits that, that taste kind of like a bland peach. But it doesn't seem to set the tree back. The tree seems like it's doing fine. You know? So it's a parasite, but it uh, just kind of lives in harmony. But, uh, you know, the tree doesn't, I don't think the tree really gets anything back from it. So it is technically a parasite. It's not symbiotic. But look, isn't that cool? They form their own little woody, uh, woody gulls, little woody storage areas. You know, where my ceiling can hide out. Okay, it's starting to warm up a little bit now. I'm getting hot with my four layers. Anyway, this plant is pretty important to mention here. You can see lichen happily growing in it. This is Bakia guniana, another member of the Myrtaceae. Almost looks like a juniper. Dominant plant here, once it opens up, it's sun-loving. You got a nice understory of moss right here. And here are the leaves of uh, Bakia. When it's uh, flowering, just uh, five distinct white petals. Five unfused white petals. And... Uh, you know, just typical mertaceous flowers. The central disc, style in the center, bisexual flower, etc. Just little scrubby mertaceous, probably loving the acid soils, probably got a lot of mycorrhizal activity going on too. Okay, this one's a rare one, and it's a much more diminutive species than the other species in the genus, at least that I've seen. This is in the genus Hovea, and this is Hovea Montana. It's a little purple pea with simple leaves. Look at it, and they don't come to uh, that little point like Oxalobium does. Just for comparison, I got the oxalobium and uh, hovea next to each other. Hovea on the right, oxalobium on the left. Compare, look at it, look at it in the mentum as well. You got the, the orange fuzz on the right, white uh, on the uh, axial side of uh, the one on the left, which is oxalobium, ellipticum. And then uh, oxalobium, of course, has that little point. Hovea doesn't. Hovea tend to be large shrubs, at least the, the ones that I've seen. But this one apparently has adapted to the uh, the very cold temperatures higher cold quote unquote higher cold temperatures we're only at like 3,000 feet here but you know at 43 degrees latitude south that gets pretty pretty chilly pretty quick but look at that those leaves are beautiful abaxial indumentum and that fuzzy fuzzy russety brown calyx oh! Oh! see look at that plant right there see there's one sprawling on tops out not even two feet right here on these exposed uh, soils Soils, I kind of kind of stutter for a minute because it's mostly rock. You get schist, you get dolerite, you get quartzite, you get uh, this. Just looks like metamorphous sandstone. Actually, this this you know what this might be the dolerite. I can't tell. You get the dolerite, which formed you know it's a it's, it's an igneous intrusive rock formed when Gondwana broke up. When you got all them rift valleys and what the shit. All right, same thing. Uh, same thing happened in South Africa. There's a lot of dolerite there. It tends to be uh, you know it's intrusive. It tends to be like a form dikes and sills and uh and then uh, the metamorphous sediments are a lot older you got any uh alpine al any alpine cobras hanging out they like to hang out by the water you know you just see it you just be walking you see a six foot long deadly venomous black snake a relative of cobras just hanging out in the middle of the trail no no cobras today but look at it look at that soil over that looks interesting huh somewhat barren Perhaps somewhat edaphically stressed. So sometimes you get a trithuria here too. They're supposed to be trithuria, which is a really weird 
uh, angiosperm, really basal angiosperm, was thought to be a graminoid, was thought to be a grass, then it was, once the DNA was looked at, it turned out really, really basal on the angiosperm family tree. Look at all the tadpoles and shit. Turned out really basal on an angiosperm family tree. Okay, more, more closely related to water lilies. But it's really hard to see, too. It's one of those plants you would just ignore if you didn't uh, have any context for it. Boggyheathlands.com Oh shit, what is that? I wish I could get over there and look at the uh, inflorescences on it. It uh, almost looks like a cattail, but it's not. It's probably a sedge of some kind. Anyway, speaking of graminoids, here's a member of the family Restianaceae, and those are the female, it's the female flowers of it. See, just the uh, upright face and bracts, right? The, the male inflorescences tend to be pendant. Another cool Gondwanan family, all right, with members in South Africa and South America. And surely, it grew on, on uh, Antarctica before it froze over. See, they're looking like grass, but, oh, but much cooler than grass, in my humble opinion. Got a weird iris coming up here on the side of the Got those uh, sword-shaped parallel veined leaves. There's the flower right there. Diplorena is the genus here. Look, there's a guy in there. Even more odd, though. I've ripped off uh, those teeples, and uh, you can check out what's going on right here. Only two stamens and then a staminode. Yeah, you can just barely see two stamens, a staminode, and then a, a slide off top. So only two stamens in this iris. Pretty odd. Never seen that before. And there's that the sheathed ovary way down there. Variations on a theme, nice. There we go. Prime tiger snake territory. They just see a six foot long black snake just sunning itself in the middle of the path. I walk very slowly up here. Anyway, here's a pretty cool uh, asp asparagalaceous monocot. Uh, in the family Asteliaceae. So it's related to Astelia, which is a rather large genus down here in the Southern Hemisphere, and uh, especially in uh, Australia, New Zealand. This is in the genus Milligania. And it basically, it just looks like an Astelia, uh, which they call pineapple or something, even though it's got no relation to pineapples, completely different order, uh, but it's got larger flowers. So it looks like a, it looks like a showy or Astelia, and they're on escape. They're not nestled within all those uh, leaves, that, that leaf rosette. And indeed, they are showy. Fuzzy as hell, kind of pink you got like a triffid stigma down there i think so six tepals and a uh, fuzzy bricks fuzzybricks.com look at how woolly that scape is too got to be an adaptation to the cold temperatures up here uh in this alpine environment remember it's only like three thousand feet maybe a little bit higher but we're at such a high latitude it's quite chilly it's getting down to we're supposed to get down to freezing tonight so it's about i don't know maybe 55 or 60 right now and then we got in this heat land, we got, I'm getting warm by, swarmed by flies. We got the gymnasinus, we got all kinds of damn graminoids, members of Cyperaceae, we got some uh, members of Restianaceae. And since we're talking about Gondwanan distributions, we have the genus Notonia, which uh, I believe I've seen in Chile as well as South Africa. Ranunculaceae is the family here. Look at that uh, quote unquote evolutionarily primitive uh, flower, okay? You get multiple petals. It's a uh, ranunculaceae, the buttercup family. And uh, you can see it's got the stamens, multiple stamens surrounding uh, that uh, many carpeled ovary, apocarpus ovary, and then those brown little filaments up top are the styles all going down into uh, each style uh, corresponding to a to an individual uh, carpel. So apocarpus ovaries. What's the underside of that look like? Oh yeah, it's hairy, of course, because we're up kind of high. You got colline leaves, and then there's basal leaves, but they're hiding beneath this. Uh, this is that an astelia, or is that one of the milliganies? I don't fucking know. Okay, who can tell? I can't tell right now. I have to look after I'm done filming. Anyway, pretty cool to uh, to note that all these plants, okay, which surely occurred on Antarctica too a long time ago, Chile, South Africa, and uh, down here in uh, Australia. Oh look at that! He just got a leech. We should keep. We need a. We need a mascot for the trip. He was on your ankle, huh? Yes. Yeah, he, un, he went under the pants. Yeah, he's just trying to make an honest day's pay. You can't blame him for it. Look at that dolerite, aka diabase. Look at it. Doing a doing a quasi columnar thing, just like basalt would do, except it's a. This is of course a cool more slowly. And underground is considered an intrusive igneous rock. Look at that. You get the, the little columns. Looks like an ancient volcano. All right. Remnants of the rift between Antarctica and Tasmania. Look at that beautiful delegatensis. 
Look at it. Anyway, that's all I got for you this evening. This morning, I don't know what that, I guess it's evening. It's morning here, so it's technically evening uh, in the States. That's all I got for you. Hopefully you got something out of that incredible forest here. Relics of Gondwana. Really gives you some perspective about where you fit into all this, you know? When you realize Antarctica used to have forests on it, plate tectonics been going about, dispersing plants and animals, okay? You also got oceanic dispersal, but that's not the case with many of these. And uh, of course, uh, you know, what are, what are cornerstones of an ecosystem? In this case, eucalyptus, among uh, many mertaceous bastards and apacrids and peas. You know, and then of course you got just a bounty of fungal diversity in those soils too. That's all I got. Have a good rest of your day, evening, morning, whatever shit, go fuck yourself. Bye.